you coming back from spring break uh, on Monday uh, it's just a session I may choose to put in exercise 12 uh, if I do or start it at least and if I do I will let you know well in advance you know sometime I'll send out an announcement so please watch your announcements and uh, if that's the case then there will be just only a pre-lab quiz for exercise for the pre-lab for exercise 12, that's all. Uh, the, the lecture quiz will be on Wednesday next week, and it will, uh, just to remind you what it will cover, it will cover from the previous, uh, well, the uh, animal slides, from uh, synapsid mammalium, okay, that's where I started, uh, through the tissues, and through what I get through today, okay? So that will be on. Also for the last quiz, um, that which I have yet to, to grade, it, it came to my attention that one of the questions I asked was for synapomorphies for arthropoda. But that quiz should have started from mandibulata. Okay, so that probably was, some people were not prepared for that. So that's uh, one point. So I'm gonna take that one point for uh, giving synapomorphies for arthropoda and put that elsewhere. And uh, those of you who answered that question correctly, those will be bonus points. Okay, so it's possible to get 11 or 16 out of 15 on this particular quiz. Okay, I think that's all the announcements that I have to make. So we'll just get into things right now. Okay, so our went over tissues, and without getting into digestion in animals. Okay. Uh, just uh, right, this is a good topic to go over, just right before lunchtime, okay? All right, so digestion, the overview of what's going on here. Okay, so one of the reasons, we're heterotrophs. All animals are heterotrophs, and as being heterotrophs, we have to get a lot of things pre-made outside of us. Minimally, minimally, we have to get organic molecules and essential nutrients. Uh, we have a lot of pathways by which we have organic molecules in some form that we can transform those into something else, okay? But still, we can't just take carbon dioxide and create our own organic molecules, and therefore we're heterotrophs and we have to eat. And uh, what we get from our food, one, the dietary need is uh, the food that you eat serves primarily for fuel. And in fact, most of the calories you take in, in your food, disappear as carbon dioxide and water because they're used to keep you alive, okay? And so you have a respiration, which never stops. And uh, therefore, uh, fuel is the biggest, biggest uh, uh, aspect of your food. But furthermore, it provides materials for biosynthesis. Some parts of your body break down and they have to be replaced. And therefore, this is raw material that you have uh, bio biochemical pathways that can produce certain compounds to replace what gets worn out or lost. Furthermore, it's a source of essential nutrients. Now, a nutrient is essential if we don't have the way to make it. It has to be obtained, ready-made from our food, okay? Um, that's the case. So I'm going to look at all three of these different ideas. So one of them is for fuel. This is for cellular respiration. And actually in cellular respiration, any carbon compound can be used. It may have to be modified into one of the entry points that's in the glycolysis pathway or in the Krebs cycle. But nonetheless, uh, we have the pathway. It can be, for example, amino acid. The only thing that can't be utilized is amine groups, okay? Nitrogen-containing groups, we have to cut them off, and there's no way to store that material. 
therefore it has to be converted into either um, uric acid or urea and it is eliminated from the body. But the carbon skeleton, however, of a, of a protein can be modified into, for example, alpha ketoglutarate, which can be fed into the ferricidal into acetate or into other path substrates that are already in the pathway, okay? Um, and therefore, that can be used that way. However, not all of the um, energy content of these macromolecules or various types of molecules are included. So for any sort of carbohydrate, and this is average, okay, because it's going to be different between, you know, probably fructose and glucose and lactose would all have the same caloric content, but there's other types of sugars where it might be a little bit different. But nonetheless, by and large, a carbohydrate is about 4.6 kilocalories per gram of carbohydrate. That's the energy content. Uh, and that's about uh, the same also for proteins. Proteins are almost the same. So carbohydrates, proteins give the same amount of fuel energy. Fats on the other hand, lipids, lipids are twice, almost a little bit more than twice the energy content, okay? And so that's a rich source of food or energy. And this is one of the reasons why uh, as far as long-term energy storage in animals, it is stored as fat because it has more calories per gram. If you converted all of your carbohydrate reserves in your body into, no, no, it's the other way around. If you converted all of your fat in your body into um, carbohydrates, well, for me, I would probably weigh about 60 pounds more. Okay, that's, so this is a cheap way to carry energy that is a good low weight. Okay, so uh, what happens with your food, as far as uh, the carbohydrates, is that uh, the glucose that you take in in your food is eventually uh, arrives at the liver and converted into glycogen, which is a storage carbohydrate. So what I mean, storage carbohydrate is in the form of uh, polysaccharide, storage polysaccharide, with, in which glucose can be quickly mobilized. Okay, can be quickly mobilized. This is in contrast to uh, structural polysaccharides. And structural polysaccharides such as cellulose, that the glucose is stored, that is in there, is not easily mobilized into glucose. And furthermore, it's used for structure. So the amount of um, glycogen that's stored in the typical human, in both, uh, most of it's in the liver, some of it is in skeletal muscle, is enough to keep you uh, running on glucose for about 24 hours if you're not doing any strenuous activities. And so that's just normal, okay? And that's all. Fat, however, is long-term, okay? Depending on how much adipose tissue is there. Um, if you, in fact, if you have a high sucrose or a high carbohydrate diet, and you exceed the storage ability of the liver to store that carbohydrate, it is converted into fat, okay? And then stored in um, various adipose tissues all throughout the body. And first, the body prefers to use glycogen, glucose, as a source for cellular respiration. But when that source disappears or runs low, then this body starts using lipids. And once you run out of lipids, which depending on how much are stored, sometimes you can go for quite a long time uh, without eating, as long as you have a good lipid supply. Um, once it runs out, then the body starts burning protein. And that's when starvation is really, really vital. Some terms that you find talking about nutrition, undernourished is when you're not taking in enough calories, and it doesn't matter what form of calories it is. It could be carbohydrate, it could be lipid, it could be protein. Now, notice I'm not saying anything about nucleic acids. Because nucleic acids, what is that nucleotide composed of? Three components. What is the three sub parts of a nucleotide? Phosphate group. What? Uh, phosphate group. Phosphate group. Adenosine. What? Adenosine. Uh, 
Nitrogen based? No, it's identical. Are you asking what is it? I'm asking for the three components for nuclear for nuclear power. Yeah, the beginning of the component. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what is it made of? Phosphate? What else? Deoxyribose or ribose sugar. What? Deoxyribose or ribose sugar. Okay, yeah, pentose sugar. Okay, sugar. It's carbohydrate. Okay, that can be used for regular cellular respiration. And the other part is a nitrogen base. A nitrogen base, since it has mostly nitrogen, it has the same problems as amino groups. We can't really use it. We can only break it down and get rid of it. Okay, so, um, so I'm not talking about that. Uh, so, undernourished is when you are, your body requires more calories, you're using more calories than what you're taking in, okay? It's an energy deficit. That's really what um, undernourished is. Most of us in Western societies, and it's becoming actually almost all throughout the world anymore, have to be overnourished. This is when you're taking in more calories than what your body really needs. And under those circumstances, and it doesn't matter where those calories are coming from, uh, this is something that a lot of fad diets try to convince you differently, but the whole thing about losing weight, the whole problem is if the calories in don't match the calories out, if you're taking in more calories than what you're using, you will gain weight, period. And it doesn't matter, high carbohydrate di diets, high protein diets, it's all a matter of calories, all right? And uh, nothing beyond that. So, take in more calories than what you need. It'll be converted to fat and stored. Uh, another term here that often is used interchangeably with undernourished, but it doesn't mean the same thing, is malnourished. You can be overnourished, but malnourished at the same time. This here, malnourishment, is referring to having a deficit of essential nutrients. The essential nutrient is essential if you cannot make it, and you have to get it already made in your diet. And I'll come across some of those here in a moment. So uh, all these three groups of uh, molecules can be interchanged, okay? We have animals have pathways to convert um, amino acids into fats or lipids, lipids into carbohydrates, carbohydrates into uh, fats and so forth. Now, all of these arrows imply that it's equal both ways. Uh, it actually isn't. Okay, going from a carbohydrate to a fat is metabolically pretty easy. Going from a, um, a fat to a carbohydrate is not so metabolically easy. And definitely going from carbos to amino acids or fats to amino acids is problematic. It's very easy to go from an amino acid to either one of these, but not the other way around. One of the reasons is that amino acids contain nitrogen. These don't contain nitrogen. The only way that you can convert a uh, carbon skeleton into an amino acid is there is a, a amino group donor available. And usually the amino group donor is another amino acid, okay? These have nitrogen, these don't. And that is what creates part of the problem. Yes? So, so going from a carb to a fat is easy, right? Going from a carb to a fat, yeah, because you're taking out oxygen. That's a, a fairly easy by dehydration reaction to get rid of the oxygen. And then amino to either is easy. So is fats like a, a dead end, so to say, so to speak? Is it hard to go either no, way? No, no, no. Most of that, it, it can, Usually the fats have to be burned in cellular respiration, but there are pathways to convert, to put oxygen in, okay? But it is not, those pathways are not as simple and energy free as the other way around. So, it's, uh, so I'm not saying it can't be done, all right? It's just that it's easier to go one way than the other, okay? All right, so nitrogen is a, a big problem here. Okay, so uh, in animals, in vertebrates, uh, most of these conversions take place in the liver. Your liver is a master organ. It's very important in many, many different processes in the body. Uh, now, in other animals that we've been looking at, such as earthworms and uh, uh, insects, they really don't have the equivalent of our liver to a certain extent, 
um, but they have other places in their body where this takes place. All right, so one of the things that we get from our diet is uh, essential nutrients. Okay, so this is something that the animal requires, but you don't have the pathway to make it from a precursor molecule. The precursor molecules might be there, okay? So precursor molecules might be there in the diet, but there's some, if you remember from 101A, there's a lot of things that are biochemical pathway. So we have one step here where the enzyme converts one compound to another, another enzyme converts to this step, and another enzyme to this. There's a chain reaction here. If there's any enzymes in that pathway that we don't make, then the pathway can't be completed. And therefore, the end product has to be obtained in the diet completely, fully made. So that's what, and what is essential for one group of animals may not be essential for another group of animals. It really depends on the pathways. So uh, once again, emphasizing what malnourishment means, means that your diet is not giving you a sufficient amount of a particular essential nutrient that you can't make. Okay, so uh, a lot of these are amino acids. Okay, proteins in animals, uh, there are a lot of different amino acids, but not all of these amino acids are found incorporated in the polypeptide. Uh, there are 20 basic amino acids, eight of which for humans are essential. We cannot make them. We have to make them and get them ready made. Now, uh, th compare this to other vertebrates, or no, other animals, since we're talking about animals here. Uh, for example, a rat, which is a model organism that we study quite a bit, is 10 different amino acids that happen to be essential for a rat. The same eight that are for human, plus two more. If we compare this to a, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, a Drosophila fly, uh, they also have the same, about the same 10 amino acids but from different groups, they may not have the same essential amino acids. However, these eight that are essential for humans do seem to be widespread as essential amino acids throughout the animal kingdom. Okay, so uh, you can have a diet with a high protein diet and still be protein deficient, simply because that diet is not giving you those eight essential amino acids or even if it's providing those eight essential amino acids, they may not be providing them in the same ratio as what you need incorporated in your proteins, okay? And that creates a problem, all right? And I'm gonna go through looking at this in a little bit more detail here, okay? So, uh, body cannot store these amino acids. That's sort of an interesting thing because nitrogen is really limiting in living systems. It's a real problem, even for plants. Even though our atmosphere is almost 70% nitrogen, that is molecular nitrogen with three covalent bonds. Very, very hard to break down into a, a form that living things can use. And so evolution has never brought out a way to store nitrogen. And therefore, when we have amino acids that are in excess in our body, they have to be deaminated. Deamination means removing the amine group. It's removing that amine group. And it's not that what you have, you remove it, it's ammonia. Okay, ammonia is highly toxic, but it's also highly soluble. And animals such as us, where we have limited um, surroundings of water, uh, that has to be converted into urea, and we get rid of it. We can store carbohydrates, we can store fats, but we can't store amino acids. So when you eat protein, and it gets into your, broken down into amino acids, your body has to use it, or you lose it, period, okay? All right, now, um, we can do non-essential amino acids. The non-essential amino acids we can synthesize from a carbon, from a sugar carbohydrate, as long as we have a nitrogen donor. Now, why would we need to make a 
non-essential amino acids because of the ratios. It might be that uh, um, your food source gives you very little alanine, which is non-essential, and uh, but you got too much of another amino acid, maybe histamine or something like that. So uh, you need to increase the amount of alanine, and you can do that by taking an amine group from one other is non-essential amino acid that we had in access, remove the nitrogen group, and put it on a sugar substrate to turn it into the appropriate amino acid. So this is called transamination. Transamination, and it's uh, performed, once again, it's an enzymatic process, and it's performed by special, this is a group of um, enzymes called aminotransferase. So, for example, to make um, alanine, the specific amino transferase would be called amino um, allotransferase. Okay, so, but I, you just need to know the nature of the group, but realize that there are individual special uh, forms of this enzyme for each amino acid. And so this is an illustration I put together to show you what happens here. So this is amino acid one, you don't need to worry exactly about what it is, but this is the amino group, okay, that's charged, that's typical. And uh, let's say that we have, uh, don't have enough, or we have too much of this amino acid, but not enough of amino acid two. So this here, amino acid one, can be used as a amino, or a, a, a amino group donor to be passed over onto amino acid two, but that requires also a sugar substrate. Usually the sugar substrate is some form of something called an alpha keto acid. Uh, one that's real common in the body is alpha ketoglutarate. So I'm illustrating this with alpha ketoglutarate because that is a very important alpha keto acid, but each amino acid would require a different alpha keto acid. So we can take the amine group on this, remove it, pass it on to alpha ketoglutarate, and it becomes the amino acid glutamate, okay? And then uh, the, the remaining carbon skeleton of our first amino acid becomes some form of an alpha keto acid, which we can send to other pathways, can be used in other things, or it can be used in cellular respiration. All right. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing glutamate because glutamate is a major way in which uh, nitrogen waste is taken to the liver to be converted into urea. And so, one of the fate of, uh, of um, glutamate is that it will uh, deliver the amine group to the liver, and we get rid of it eventually. That urea gets into our bloodstream, and as we'll see a little bit later, it goes to our kidneys, our kidneys removes it, and it ends up in our urine. Uh, but this is also used for, uh, as a uh, donor. So another fate here is if we have alpha keto acid two that's appropriate, then this can be, glutamate can be the amino group donor, it requires a different amino transferase than what happened here but nonetheless it will transfer it over onto alpha keto acid two, and now we have our second amino acid, and this regenerates our alpha keto uh, glutarate. So alpha keto glutarate, it can also be used in cellular respiration. The en entry point for this molecule is in the middle of the Krebs cycle, all right? So the main take home here is not that you know alpha keto glutarate, but that you understand what's happening here with transamination, okay? So we're just decreasing this amount of this amino acid and increasing that, but the total number of amino acids is unchanged. We're not changing the amount of amino acids we have. We're just simply converting one that we have in excess, excess to one which we don't have enough of but the numbers remain the same. Now, if you take in your diet more amino acids than what protein synthesis requires in your body, then all those excess amino acids are simply deaminated. We can use the carbon skeleton and the amine groups 
are changed in the urea you get rid of. Okay, so this can either be recycled, used again, or goes into the Krebs cycle. Okay, now, uh, as a consequence of this problem with the central amino acids, uh, even I mean, the protein that you eat may not provide you with all the amino acid, or you may not be able to use all the amino acids that's in the food that you happen to eat. And we measure the efficiency here by something that's called the net amino acid utilization. Okay. So each organism requires a certain ratio of amino acid overall in all your general protein. So I'm illustrating this not with 20 amino acids, but I'm going to illustrate it with just four. Okay, lysine, alanine, glycine, valine. Valine and lysine are essential amino acids. We can't make them. We get them fully made in the diet. And so let's say that your food source happens to be this. This is the type of protein that you ate. It might be a mushroom. And therefore, uh, but the ratio between these four amino acids in the food happens to be a one to one to one to one ratio. The problem is, is that when you use these four amino acids in your body, they have to be incorporated into your proteins in a ratio of one lysine to five alanine to one glycine to four valine. So the whole point here, given this, and what you have, how many of these amino acids that you ate can actually be used? You have a different ratio, and you may not be able to uh, use them all unless the food source you ate has exactly the same ratio of amino acids as what you need. So the best thing to, ate, to eat is something more similar to your own proteins. But although mushrooms are real high in protein, they are also quite out of balance with what an animal needs in terms of protein. So let's just analyze this. Uh, what's going to limit how many of these, because we have here 80 amino acids. How many of those 80 amino acids can we actually incorporate into our own proteins? Um, well, what limits it is the essential amino acids because we can't make them. But what we need to do is maximize the use of the uh, essential amino acids. We want to use as many of the essential amino acids as possible. To maximize that, all right? Because there are what it's limiting. But if we look at the ratio between valine and uh, lysine, we have to have four times more valine than lysine. See that? They have to be in a one to four ratio in our body. We need four times more. Therefore, valine is the limiting factor here. If we try to use all 20 of these lysines, it requires that we have 80 valines, four times more than 20. We don't have that. We have, we're limited by this. That's all we have. And therefore, this is the limiting factor. It is the limit. So we want to maximize the use of that limited essential amino acid. We're going to use all 20 of them. And therefore, what given that, what ratio of glycine do we have to have? The ratio between glycine and uh, valine is one to four. So how many of these glycines can we incorporate as glycine? Five. Okay. So uh, we, that's all we can do. We have plenty of glycine, and therefore we can, take, we can use glycine straight, but that leaves us a 15 over that we cannot incorporate. Okay, so the ratio between valine and alanine is what? It's one to one. So how many glycine do we need? Or alanine, sorry. Because it's, oh, wait, wait, sorry. 
I'm in the wrong place. I compare. It's a five, four to five for alanine. Given that ratio, how much alanine do we need to incorporate? What is five over four times 20? How much? 25. So we require 25. We don't have 25. But we have 15 of these left over. These are non-essential amino acids. So we can use our 20 alanine that we have, and if we have five of the appropriate alpha keto acids, we can use five of these glycines, transfer the amino group over to this, and we have our um, alanine. That leaves us now with 10 glycine that we can't incorporate. And now, how much of the lysine can we incorporate? The ratio is one fourth. What's one fourth of 20? Five. That's all we can use. Even though it's an essential amino acid, that's all we can use. And uh, therefore, we have 15 lysine left over. So um, we have incorporated this, but we have 25 amino acids that we can't use. And therefore, we can only deaminate it. They go to the liver, deamination. We don't throw away the carbon skeleton. The carbon we can use, okay? We can do something with it. Eventually, even if we have to convert it to fat, we can still do something with it, but nothing with the amino groups. They have to be deaminated and be uh, stored. So what this net uh, amino acid utilization is, it is the amount of amino acids in your food that you were able to incorporate given the number of amino acids that you took in in your food, okay? We've incorporated, you add these up, 55 amino acids. All together in our foods, we had 80 amino acids. And therefore, the um, net amino acid utilization is 68.8%. We were able to use only 68.8% of the protein that we took in. Now, obviously, the more similar the protein is to your body, the higher the amino acid uh, utilization. Okay? So, this can become a problem. All right? So, um, many, these are the eight essential amino acids and you don't need to memorize them. Just know that there's eight essential amino acids, but um, certain foods might be high in one type of or several types of essential amino acids and low in others. And some civilizations just by uh, observation, not by scientific means, but just by casual observation, have created diets that will balance this out. For example, many Native American uh, Civilization like the Aztecs and, and uh, in Central America, they eat a lot of beans and corn. Okay, they have a diet that's rich in both of these. Now, the thing here is that the uh, beans are very low in methionine; they don't have it. Whereas the corn is high in methionine, and so by combining these two together, it brings up the net amino acid utilization. And compensates, and therefore, this works pretty well. So, by mixing, having a, a uh, highly variable diet will lead to balancing out your diet a lot better. Okay, believe it or not, uh, there are actually uh, essential fatty acids as well. Okay, usually we hear a lot about fat, 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 fat. Okay, and you shouldn't eat so much fat. Actually, it's, um, there's certain fatty acids that you really need that are essential. And the real problem with fat in their diet is the ratio between saturated fatty, fatty acids and non-saturated fatty acids. The ratio should be something like one to four, okay? But in our diets, it's actually something like one to 12, okay? We get way too much saturated fatty acid. Uh, but some of these, um, non-saturated 
or excuse me, yeah, non-saturated fatty acids, especially things that call omega-6 and omega-3, is that um, we animals usually cannot make them. Okay. Do you, did Dr. Barnard go over anything about what omega-6 and 3? First of all, what's a saturated fatty acid versus non-saturated fatty acid? Well, let's go even further back. Uh, what's a fatty acid? Here. What's a fatty acid? Triglycerides is a fat. Fatty acids and fats are so much so 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 Okay, it has a carboxyl group. What else? It's an all hydrocarbon chain. And so it's a chain, linear chain, which all that is said there is just hydrogen. Okay. Now, if all of these carbons are filled to the max with all the carbons, uh, all the hydrogens that you probably can have, that is a saturate. However, if you remove two carbons, then you have to have a carbon-carbon double bond. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, this molecule doesn't have the full amount of hydrogen that it could possibly theoretically carry because of that double bond, and that is unsaturated. Okay, now this, uh, if you just have one carbon carbon double bond, that's a model unsaturated fatty acid. Okay, whereas if it's two or more, it's called polyunsaturated. And um, when it's talking about omega 3s and omega 6, it's counting the first, where the location of the double double bond is from the methyl group, okay? Which is sort of strange because really biochemists, when we name these things, we're naming them from the carboxyl group. But for dietitians, when we're talking about omega, it's uh, omega-3 means carbon one, two, three, and there's our carbon-carbon double bond. For omega-6, one, two, three, four, five, come up here, six carbons from the methyl end, and it has a carbon-carbon double bond. Now, a lot of these are very important, and uh, as I said, we can't, a lot of animals can't make, and we have to get them in our diet. And uh, some of these polyunsaturated fatty acids are actually real important in the brain. Uh, they're in the membranes of the brain, they're very essential to the way in which the neuron uh, plasma membranes operate. So uh, what we need in our diet a lot of times because we can't make a lot of it, is uh, alpha linoleic acid and linoleic acid, okay? Now, I don't know if Dr. Barney went over this, but this is the sort of a, a, a saturation formula for, for these uh, fatty acids. So when we have the 18.3 omega-3, the 18 means that the carbon chain is 18 carbons long. The number after the dot states how many, how many carbon-carbon uh, double bonds are in that molecule. So this particular one has three unsaturated, or three carbon-carbon double bonds, and one of those happens to be at the uh, omega-3 position, all right? There's more to this formula that I go into, because uh, really the formula can tell you exactly from the carboxyl end where each and every one of those carbon-carbon double bonds happen to be. But uh, you didn't take 101A with me, so we're not gonna worry about that, okay? So uh, this is all I want you to know. For linoleic acid, 18 carbons long. This is also 18 carbons long, but what makes them different is the number of carbon-carbon double bonds. So a little difference in a biological molecule makes a big difference, okay? So this has three, this has two. Furthermore, this does not have a, its first carbon-carbon um, double, double bond from the methyl end is not at carbon three, but at carbon six. Therefore, they're different. Some other important 
ones here is um, isopinazoic acid, 20, five carbon copy double bonds. So this is uh, a molecule that's found in brain tissue, as well as DHA, glucosa, hexanoic acid, so forth. Now, do I want you to know these? No. Okay, I'm just putting them up there as examples, letting you know that fatty acid um, chemistry can be very complicated, and that each fatty acid can differ in length, and in saturation, and in the location, and, and the location of those carbon-carbon double bonds. And it's these that we have, animals have problems making. We can make some, for example, we can make some of this glucose hexanoic acid, but we don't make enough of it. Therefore, we have to get some of it to excess, right? Another essential nutrient is vitamins. These are small organic molecules that uh, chemical composition is very varied, you know, with them, but we only need them in small amounts, okay? Uh, not as much as essential amino acids, we need those in pretty good quantities. Central fatty acids, we need those in pretty good quantities, but vitamins we don't, okay? And many of them happen to be coenzymes or parts of coenzymes or precursors of coenzymes that function in various, um, pro, in various um, enzymes, especially in cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So we don't have to worry about photosynthesis because we can't do it, right? So a lot of times deficiencies, if we don't get enough of it, it can cause some severe effects. And uh, I'm, we're not gonna go into each and every vitamin, just in broad categories. There are water-soluble vitamins and lipid-soluble vitamins. So all the B vitamins and vitamin C happen to be water-soluble. And once again, just like amino acids, these are not stockpiled. So you use them or you lose them, okay? So if you take in excess, water-soluble vitamins, your body will use what you have taken in in your diet, and the excess will eventually be lost in your kids, okay, through your urine. Uh, the fat-soluble vitamins, lipid-soluble, A, P, and E, and K, uh, they can, since they're lipid-soluble, they end up in membrane, okay? So your body can accumulate it. And therefore, it is possible to have too much vitamin A. But with a normal diet, that's usually not a problem. In order to have an excess of vitamin A, we have to be taking mega quantities of vitamin A in order to reach it. But they can become toxic because membrane structure, you have a bunch of a certain molecule there in excess of what it should be, will mess up and interfere with input membrane function. Okay, so I do want you to know that the water soluble vitamins are the B vitamins and vitamin C. Okay, but there's a lot of B vitamins. And most of those B vitamins are really important in cellular respiration. So niacin is involved in cellular respiration, peroxine, biotin, all of these are real important for cellular respiration as coenzymes. In a lot of the molecules that are in the, the uh, uh, electron transport chain. Okay, as I said, the body can synthesize it, it's, um, if the body can synthesize it, it's not a vitamin. For example, vitamin C is a vitamin for us, but it isn't for dogs. Dogs can make it, okay? Uh, most primates cannot make vitamin C, but most other animals can. And therefore, ascorbic acid, which is a chemical name for vitamin C, is not a vitamin for most animals. Yes, like for those vitamins, like you you have to take a lot to be like you said possible. Why is it that the body doesn't just like when the first go like the first dosage doesn't just take it so that it can get like good? Why do you have to take multiple amounts of dosage for you to be why do you have to continue to take it? Yeah, to take that because your your body is absorbed. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you you either incorporate them, use them at the time. Uh, I'm 
why I say it every time. I mean, within 24 hours. You know, the, 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 once this gets in your blood, it doesn't, if you have excess, it doesn't completely disappear into the kidney. But each time blood flows, circuits through the kidney, the amount of those vitamins that you're not using will drop, 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 drop in your blood. And you get some. But yeah, but we don't store them. Okay, so they have to be used or not. Okay. So this is a table from your textbook. You might just look it over. As I said, I'm not going to worry about. I just wanted you to know that there's water-soluble vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, and that it's the C and B vitamins that happen to be uh, water-soluble. The others, D, A, and K, happen to be fat-soluble. And therefore, these tend to hang up in um, membranes. And therefore, they can stay there. And this also gives sources, common sources, main function. I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, the only detail about the B vitamins I want you to know is that a lot of them are involved in catalytic activities and cellular respiration. Okay. And the last uh, dietary requirement, minerals. These are inorganic. And inorganic uh, ions, they serve many different functions in the body. Uh, for example, for structure, calcium, potassium, both components of bone. Okay, very important there. And in fact, uh, calcium does a little bit more than that. It's involved in a lot of membrane uh, functions and it has to be highly regulated in your body. If you have too much of it, it's real bad. If you have too little of it, then uh, your body will take calcium out of your bones, which leads to other problems, okay? Um, some of these serve as electrolytes, okay? Uh, this is uh, keeping the correct osmotic balances between your body fluids and cell content of cytoplasm. Uh, this involves potassium, sodium, chlorine. These are the major ones that are involved in that activity. So if somehow these disappear, that you have bad diarrhea, or, you're, uh, or something like that, and you're losing a lot of these from your body, and you compensate by drinking a lot of water, then it's going to really affect the size of your cells. And if you put too much water in your body without these things there, then those cells will swell up and burst. Okay? That can happen. All right? Some other things that function as cofactors in enzymes uh, involve magnesium, copper, iron, zinc. Um, iron and zinc are real important. Iron is not only just only a cofactor in enzymes, but um, it's also a cofactor in protein, but it's not an enzyme, it's a hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is involved in, in carrying oxygen to the body. You have to have that. Zinc is a second uh, major cofactor for enzymes. It's so a lot of enzymes that require zinc. Magnesium is big. Okay, so you have to have these in our diet. Okay, so those are the essential in, um, ingredients of our diet that we have to have. Uh, now, as far as feeding in general, there are certain terms that are used for feeding categories. For example, um, if we look at how, what is being eaten by a heterotroph, uh, we call herbivores. They're the ones who are eating plants. Those that happen to eat other animals called carnivores. Uh, those who eat both called omnivores. And this doesn't really exhaust it. Wouldn't you call something that just eats a bunch of Would it be a herbivore? Would it be a carnivore? An omnivore. It, it's solely a bunch of What do you think? If it ain't bunch of what would it be? Stab at it? A what? A your name? Your okay, how about a fungivore? A fungivore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But this, uh, although somewhat ecologically useful, it isn't really all that useful. Really, what's uh, more interesting for physiology is the mechanism of feeding. Okay, that uh, tells us a lot more. 
So there's some animals that are suspension feeders. I've been calling them filter feeders, same thing. Uh, suspension feeders means that the food particles are dissolved, uh, small food particles that are dissolved in a vast medium that they have to sift the food particles out of that medium. And some of these can be real big, mainly whales. That's what they do with krill. Uh, so they swim through the ocean, mouth open, squeezing up these small types of crustaceans called krill and uh, letting the water go out through the bathing uh, of their, uh, in their mouth and then swallowing the krill. Clams, I already talked about that they were filter feeders. Okay? And so these are suspension feeders. There are some that are substrate feeders. Uh, like maggots, okay? So they live in their food. Uh, so there's various types of worms that will be right inside nematodes. A lot of them are this type of thing as well. And on some Friday nights, you can find some people that are also at a restaurant with a face down in their plate, and then that's the substrate feeders of that community. Actually, no, okay? There, so other things that are filter feeders. Okay, so this includes mosquitoes, leeches, aphids, hummingbirds, and bees because their food is dissolved in liquid and they are sucking up the liquid and uh, filtering out uh, the food particles that happen to be there. Uh, usually you don't think of hummingbirds and bees as being uh, filter feeders or food feeders, but they're feeding on nectar and flowers. And so that makes them in this category. Some people are that too on Friday nights. Okay, and then there's bulk feeders, which we fit into. So they take large chunks of food and swallow it. Okay, so um, these are bulk feeders. They doesn't mean that they eat the whole organism. They may just take chunks out of an organism, uh, bites out of it, such as herbivores. Herbivores doesn't come along and necessarily eat up a whole bush. Okay, they'll strip many of the leaves, but the bush is still there. Okay, still ingesting large portions of food. All right, so uh, types of um, now all this food that is taken in usually consists of macromolecules. Macromolecules that have to be disassembled before they can ever be taken into the body and used. Because, for example, proteins, proteins are being eaten, made up of amino acids, but not in the same order that we, that a, the organism would need in its own proteins. They're not the organism's proteins. They're different. Therefore, they have to be completely disassembled into amino acids, and then those amino acids are reassembled into the types of proteins that is unique to that particular animal. So this happens in these digestive compartments. Only the peripera does not have any sort of digestive compartment. Everything here has to be done by uh, digested in food vacuoles taken in by the collar cells. So we talked about that in lab, collar cells. And uh, it's the collar cells that will take in a food particle by endocytosis that fuses with a vacuole or with a um, uh, lysosome and that becomes a food vacuole that will digest all of the food and then it's distributed throughout the animal. Uh, all other animals besides peripheral, they have extracellular digestion in some sort of tube or pouch-like structure. So the digestion is outside of cells primarily and um, this continues with the outside. We already looked at several groups of animals that have gastrovascular cavities. In the case of a gastrovascular cavity, the mouth and anus is one and the same. And so they just have a sac to which the food is brought in and uh, digestion takes place in that cavity and then the uh, individual cells of the body will absorb those nutrients. So like uh, platyhelminthes. Two groups we have, platyhelminthes, cnidaria, these are So this is where the mouth is. This is where the head is. So um, a lot of times animals are not arranged like us, right? So that pharynx is the feeding tube. When 
mouth and tongue. All other animals have an alimentary canal. So this involves uh, two different openings, opening for uh, taking in the food and uh, opening for being rid of the waste. And one of the advantages here over a gastrovascular cavity is that there's a one-way flow. The food starts at one end, goes through, and that allows for spe regional specializations within the tract to be able to take care of the food. You've already dissected an earthworm, therefore you've seen a little bit of it, its uh, digestive system. It has a mouth up here, pharynx. The pharynx only is for pushing the food back and the esophagus there. Most of the time you could not see the esophagus very well because that was where the hearts were, calciferous glands, and a lot of fat a lot of times. But then, crop gizzard. This is where it starts breaking up the food and most of the digestion and absorption of the food is in, in this uh, going through. Uh, you have also seen the digestive system of a cockroach, which would be very much like a grasshopper. There's a crop, and then they call it a gizzard. That's sort of unfortunate. That's inaccurate terminology. That's proventriculus and uh, gastric ceci. They really don't have a stomach. That's also inaccuracy on, on this figure. And then um, gastric ceci, intestine, and we saw that as a cockroach. Really, the digestive system here of a grasshopper is very much the same as what we have in a, in a uh, cockroach. In other animals, it can become more and more complex, as we will see. You don't need to understand this figure. All right, so um, almost all bilaterians, except for platyhelminthes, have an alimentary canal. And I want to emphasize that this is really technically, uh, in a physiological sense, continuous with the outside. Because you can. Uh, Food really doesn't get into your body until it is moved from that tube that goes all through you into your bloodstream. Okay, then it is in your body. Uh, we are gonads. We have openings at each end and they're continuous with the outside. You can prove this by taking, do this, take a long piece of uh, floss, tie it to your tooth, swallow it, and a few days later, uh, the end will come out the other end. You can take it and Right? So, it is continuous with the outside. <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay, now we're getting into the uh, good stuff here. What happens to your food? Okay, exactly how do you process it? So, all of the steps in feeding, one of them is ingestion, in which you get it into your digestive system. Okay, uh, the next is digestion itself. It's breaking all this material into smaller and smaller, smaller components until eventually we have the basic building blocks, the monomers, out of which all that food happens to be made. And so this involves mechanical fragmentation, okay? That is using force to break it up. You do that when you chew. An earthworm does that in their, in their gizzard and a cockroach and their proventriculus, it's mechanical fragmentation. And at the end though, everything has to be broken down enzymatically. So this involves special types of enzymes that can bind to the uh, linkages between uh, monomers, hydrolyze them. What does hydrolysis mean? What? Yeah, add water to the linkage to break it. So these are hydrolytic enzymes. And eventually then, absorption. So this is a transport of these molecules from the digestive tube into the bloodstream. And that always is across an epithelium. Always across an epithelium, okay? And then elimination. Because you don't have the enzymes to digest everything you put in your mouth. Okay. There's things that you have that, uh, for example, you eat a salad. Uh, those, uh, you know, that has a lot of starch. That's why we eat salads or plants. It's for the starch component. 
we have the enzymes to break down starch into glucose. But those are plants. What do they also have which we cannot digest? We need cellulose. And where is that cellulose located? So cell walls. They have cell walls and cellulose that is not digestible. And there's other types of carbohydrates that, for example, in beans, there's a, a triglyceride that it has three sugar units that, uh, and also there's one of the four sugar units that we don't have the enzyme to break it down. And therefore it goes into your colon where a lot of times bacteria can break it down and they produce gas sometimes, all right? So I'm not gonna look at all the different uh, uh, digestive systems and all the animals. We can concentrate here on the mammalian system and what happens to your food through the mammalian system. So in mammals, such as ourselves, uh, the alimentary canal and its accessory glands are part of the digestive system. And down this digestive tube, starting particularly from the stomach on through, uh, that all the organs consist of three layers, or four layers, four tissue layers. So on the innermost, okay, this hollow space on the inside is called the lumen. The lumen is just a all-purpose word for any open cavity in a tube or sac-like structure. All right, so uh, this lumen is lined by an epithelium. That epithelium is a simple cuboidal epithelium, and it's called a mucosa. And as we'll see, that mucosa does a lot of the important functions of enzymatic digestion. Going toward the outside of the lumen, the next layer is a layer of connective tissue. It's called submucosa. You don't need to know submucosa, but I do want you to know mucosa. Okay, that's the uh, simple cuboidal epithelium that binds lumen of uh, this digestive tract. And then there's uh, three layers of, of smooth muscle. Okay, so I'm counting that as one layer. It's a muscle layer. It's a muscle layer. As I said, there's four layers here. The innermost is the epithelium, connective tissue, then a muscle layer, although there's three different layers of muscle. And then on the very outside is another layer of connective tissue. So this is the general structure of this whole digestive tube, starting from the stomach on down. Okay, mucosa, connective tissue, smooth muscle, connective tissue, and what other type of tissue might be found here that I haven't mentioned? Nervous. Hmm? Nerves. Nerves. So all throughout there is also going to be nervous tissue. And blood vessels, which happen to be another type of epithelium. Okay? But still, this is the general structure of the whole tube. Okay? Now, the smooth muscle will churn the food and push it along by regional contractions that are referred to as uh, peristalsis. Where you first meet peristalsis is when you try to swallow something. Because that gets in from your pharynx into the esophagus and muscles will squeeze it, first of all contracting at the top, pushing it down, but then the next layer will contract, then the next layer will contract, so it's a wave of contractions that go rhythmically down, pushing your food down. So you can, um, swallow your food if you stand on your head, but gravity is working against that. I would suggest you do that. All right, but nonetheless, all through this system, food is moved by these rhythmic motions. And it's involuntary. In fact, all through the digestive system, it has its own nervous system that is fully detached from your brain. Okay, it operates pretty much on its own. Furthermore, along here, there are muscle. Um, areas that are called sphincters that can pinch it shut, all right, so that the food just doesn't move willy-nilly along down the force of gravity, because some things have to stay in a certain area for an amount of time. For example, in the stomach. So around the stomach, there's two different sphincters that are real important here, especially this one right here, the pyloric sphincter. Uh, this is a real strong sphincter. And when you dissect the frog and the shark, you will be able to see this from even on the outside of the digestive tube. 
Because if you're going to spin your food that's in your stomach, it has to be processed for a while before it ever gets into a small intestine. Another sphincter that's a little bit weaker is the gastroesophageal sphincter right up here between the esophagus and the stomach. Sometimes this gets irritated and weakened. And when that happens, then acid chyme, because the, the uh, material in the stomach is highly acidic, will float up into your esophagus. And the esophagus is covered by an epithelium, but it is not protected by a mucus layer. And therefore, you, you uh, feel this as heartburn. So heartburn is when this acid material is burning up into the esophagus area because that is not keeping it down in the stomach. Okay, so the digestive system here, too, um, starts in the mouth. There's an area here called the pharynx. The pharynx is a passageway for both food and air. That's a bad design, okay? It's a bad design because you can choke, okay, sometimes. Um, but that is a, the fact that we have a common passageway for both food and air is a consequence of evolution. Because somewhere in the Nathus, uh, no, uh, in the os Osloipides, you evolved lungs that came off of this that sometimes have been swim bladders, but still retain that common passageway for both food and air. All right, so from there, it's the esophagus. Nothing really happens in the esophagus except for transporting the food from the pharynx down to the stomach. Stomach, then a large, long, not large, long, small intestine. So small and large intestine is based on the diameter, not the length, okay? And then there's a large intestine that ends in the colon, in the rectum, and the anus. And so, in addition to this pipe, there's also accessory glands that still part of this digestive center in the mouth, under the tongue, and uh, sides of the mouth are salivary glands. And so when you're chewing your food, saliva is released, and it's mixed with your food, and that contains an important thing, the pancreas. This is a gland, very important gland, shown here in yellow, that fits just right near the bend of the stomach and the first part of the small intestine. And it empties its secretions right into the top of the small intestine, the part called the duodenum. It produces a lot of enzymatic enzymes, okay? Liver and gallbladder, these are also put secretions into your digestive system. The gallbladder doesn't make anything. It only stores uh, something called bile, that bile is produced by the liver itself. And then that bile is put into the gallbladder and then there is a duct, a small tube, that then comes and empties once again into the small intestine, the duodenum part of it. Okay, so that's the anatomy. Now the digestive process, you're gonna take the food, put it in your mouth, and take it on down. Okay, so in the oral cavity, it's also called the buccal cavity, uh, you mechanically fragment the food by chewing, okay? Uh, now what this does, uh, you're breaking it up into smaller and smaller pieces, which increases the surface area that is exposed to enzymes, okay? If you just, like most other animals do, just swallow their food whole, you know, it takes a longer time to uh, enzymatically break it down because uh, the enzymes are only attacking it on the surface. But by chewing it up and breaking it up into many, many small pieces, it increases the total surface area that is exposed to digestive enzymes. Chewing is a mammalian thing. Most other animals don't chew. The only two groups of animals that have evolved to, to be very extensive chewers are mammals and us, us the avian dinosaurs. All other animals do bite and swallow. Just tear it, swallow it very minimal chewing. But they rely on other structures in the digestive system, such as gizzards, sucrovitz, reculus, and other things like that to break up the food mechanically. 
Now, when you're do chewing, uh, you salivate about a liter a day. Uh, that gets that fluid gets into your digestive system a liter, and uh, that's happening almost continuously, but mostly when you have food in your mouth. So that's quite a bit. Now, what is in this saliva is a glycoprotein that's called mucin, and it is a slippery material. And so you're coating your food with this mucin, which makes it easier to swallow. Because that, without that mucin, then there would be friction. Okay, as it goes down the esophagus, there would be some drag, right? So uh, that's the function of that protein. It's a glycoprotein. Okay, so it's not just like protein. What makes it slippery is mostly the carbohydrate coating that happens to be on that protein. This is also the place where the first hydrolytic enzyme happens. Carbohydrate enzymatic digestion begins in the mouth. Okay, uh, so within the saliva is salivary amylase, and uh, this attacks um, starch and glycogen. You don't leave it there long enough to completely break this down. You swallow it usually after that. And all this does is if you were to leave it in your mouth for let's say an hour, you're sitting there chewing it for an hour or something like that, uh, it would eventually only be broken down to a disaccharide called maltose because this enzyme only attacks every other glycosidic linkage. And so complete digestion of polysaccharide by salivary amylase would leave you only with maltose. But given that you don't chew it for an hour, what you accomplish is simply breaking large molecules of starch and glycogen into smaller polysaccharides. And there's probably some maltose there too. Okay, what is maltose structurally? What does it consist of? It's a disaccharide. What does it mean when I say it's a disaccharide? Okay, it has two sugar uh, residues, okay, monomers. One of those monomers that make up maltose is glucose, okay? Two units of glucose, all right? So your tongue will roll this food that you're chewing into a ball called a food bolus, and then you swallow. And so it goes through the pharynx, which I said is a common passageway for both food and air to be breathed and it will bifurcate into two different nexus. One is the esophagus, which is open, okay? And another one is the trachea, or windpipe, which goes to your lungs, and you don't want food to go there, okay? So uh, there is a, sort of a reflex that happens. Uh, there, uh, the opening to the trachea. So this is an opening, it's not a structure, it's a clodus. That's the opening of the trachea. Uh, when you swallow, usually there is a flap of material that's called the epiglottis that sinks down over the trachea, okay, to prevent to prevent the food from going toward your lungs. However, that sometimes fails. You know, if a person is talking and they're breathing and everything at the same time, lose the control, sometimes food can go into the trachea and you choke. This is usually choking a lot of times has to do with even big pieces of meat that uh, have not been fully broken down. All right, then through the esophagus by peristalsis, food is pushed down into the food bolus, it's pushed down into the stomach. And so the stomach is, makes, it's sort of analogous to a crop in uh, earthworms. However, the only difference here, because some of the food is stored there until it, it's right time to put it into the small intestine to process it. However, the difference here is in the crop in an earthworm and also the crop in an insect, there's no enzymatic digestion. That's different here. There is some enzymatic digestion. So uh, total it, amount that it can hold on average is two liters, two liters. All right. The mucosa has, it's an epithelium, and it has cells that secrete what we call a gastric release. Okay, so here we're getting more fluid put into with our food. So some of this has to be hydrochloric acid. And in fact, it's totally different cells that are secreting hydrogen ions and chlorine ions. 
but together they constitute an acid environment. So the pH can be as low as two. So it's a very, very um, acid compartment. Now what's the function of this acidity is it can, um, acid involves acid hydrolysis, breaking down extracellular matrix. So some of the food that you're eating contains extracellular matrix. And this is breaking it down so that the cells fall apart. Okay, they're not held together. Also that acidity usually kills most bacteria. There are a few species of bacteria, however, that can stand this acid environment. But the acidity prevents you from being sick all the time, okay, with uh, bacterial infections, because the food that you eat usually does contain some bacteria, okay? But there are some that can live in this environment, okay? And the first enzyme for um, protein digestion hydrolysis is secreted here. It is secreted in an inactive form, and this is different cells in the epithelium that will secrete a cellular watery substance secreted by exocytosis into the lumen. It's called penicillin. So this is an inactive form of proteases. Okay. What is a proteinase? Proteinases, they hydrolyze uh, bonds. Now what happens to the amylase? The pH optimum for the amylase is about 7. The acidity here in the stomach is about 2. So what do you think happens to the activity of the amylase? Salivary amylase. What's its fate? Will it keep on working here? What's pH optimum? What does that mean? So this here is pH. This is the activity. That's the acidity in the stomach. This is our amylase. Okay, this is pH of seven. PH 2, is this going to be active at that pH? No, no. It's going to be, it's going to be denatured. Denatured and it stops working. However, you swallow the ball of food. Yeah, you broke it up into small pieces, but it's still swallowing the ball. And so any of that amylase that's inside that ball will still keep working for a while until it turns into mush. Okay? Once it turns into mush, then that protein is Denatured. Furthermore, um, that protein, amylase, it's protein. We want those amino acids back. And therefore, if it gets digested, you eventually will reabsorb those amino acids and remake the uh, amylase. Okay, so pepsinogen, okay? It is cleaved, so that means that there is a bond, peptide bond, that is, that is hydrolyzed. That leads to a conformational change. So this will switch from a inactive form to an active form. And the active form is called pepsin. And that's another function of the hydrochloric acid that leads to, that low pH leads to acid hydrolysis. Acid hydrolysis of a particular protein bond, peptide bond, that will lead to the conformational change and we have active pepsin. So this here, now these are separate, uh, secreted by totally different cells. Why do you think that is logical? To not, for one cell, uh, to produce the pepsinogen and the other one to produce hydrochloric acid. Why not secrete it together? To give it one thing? Well, you have proteins in your cells. You don't want this thing digesting stuff, being active inside of your cells. And so it is not active until it is in the lumen of your gut, okay? So now this is not enough to, to break down all of your protein. It attacks only peptide linkages between very specific amino acids, okay? So the most this can ever do, we don't need to know, not, not need to worry 
about what amino acid this is. But I'll give you an example. Some of these enzymes will cut on the carboxyl end of a peptide bond where the upstream uh, amino acid is lysine. So it cuts behind every lysine, but not every amino acid. Therefore, the most this could ever do is to convert big polypeptides into a bunch of shorter polypeptides. It cannot break all of the protein down. Okay, now your stomach muscles, you turn the food, you mix it so that all these enzymes and acid is thoroughly um, mixed through it. And incidentally, do I have that word up there? I don't. This, sorry, this uh, pep pepsinogen is an example of something called, I'm sure I have it on a later slide here, but zymogen. What's a zymogen? Not to find me, ever talk about zymogens? No? A zymogen is a form of a protein that is made in an inactive state, and to convert it into an active state, it requires the breakage of a peptide bond, leading to a conformational change from inactive to active. Once you do that, it's not reversible. You can't put that bond back, okay? Unlike many enzymes, they can be turned on and turned off, by a variety of ways. Uh, removing the cofactor makes it inactive. Getting the cofactor, it'll become active. Uh, but there's also allosteric regulation, which I'm sure we definitely did talk about. But with zymogens, it's produced in an inactive form. It has to be, a particular peptide bond has to be cleaved. Conformational change is active. And the only way you can inactivate it now is to destroy it, which does happen. The eventual fate of these proteins will be that they too get digested, okay? They eventually will get digested. Okay, so this is a very uh, hostile environment, and uh, as a consequence, um, the lining of your stomach, that epithelium, is highly mitotic, okay? There's a high rate of mitosis because it is replaced approximately every three days. Now, to protect it a little bit, there's also cells there that produce a complex glycoprotein that we call uh, mucus. Okay, and so this mucus sort of is at the surface of these cells and it helps protect those cells from being harmed by the acidity and the effect of uh, pepsin. However, that is not, doesn't fully uh, protect them. So these cells only last there about every and as I said, in the esophagus, there is not that mucus. And that's why when the acid, when that sphincter fails and acidity gets up into the esophagus, you feel it, that heartburn. Okay? Oh, there it is. Pepsi mentioned in the form of Pepsi. Next site where the food goes is the small intestine. Okay, so in humans, um, this is the major site of systematic digestion. It's also the site of absorption. So this is where everything finally gets broken down to its basic building blocks, and it is brought across the epithelium into the bloodstream. So uh, it's about six meters long, but when we call it a small intestine, that has to do with its diameter, not its length. And so since it is six meters long, okay, not six feet, six meters, multiply that almost by three, um, to have space for it, it has to be all coiled up. Okay, and so it's coiled up in a very systematic way. What holds it in place is connective tissues that I mentioned before called mesenteries, okay? And um, the first 25 centimeters is a real important part of it, and it's given a special name, it's called the duodenum. Okay, so what happens here, this is what receives secretions from the liver, gallbladder system, as well as from the pancreas. And so more secretions are being put into the food here as it goes through. The pancreas is a major 
internet brain is it has a duct. When I say a duct, I'm not talking mean something that goes quack quack. It's a, it's a tube that leads from the cells that produce all these enzymes into the duodenum, but it produces hydrolytic enzymes for all four groups of macromolecules. So enzymatic digestion of carbohydrates began in the mouth. Continued a little bit in the stomach, but was then stopped because our cell, salivary amylase was destroyed. In the stomach, protein digestion began, okay, but not fully. We didn't complete it. Epsom doesn't break down everything. Uh, here, it has proteinases and carbohydrates that will break down everything. Also, it breaks down all the lipids and nucleic acids, right? Furthermore, it secretes into this food a bicarbonate buffer. So, sodium bicarbonate. So there's sodium in it and an ion called bicarbonate. It's a buffer. What do buffers do? What they? They regulate pH, okay? Yeah, they, they prevent massive pH changes, okay? But yeah. So this here changes the pH because of the high amount of sodium bicarbonate to between seven and eight, okay? Now, this food moves, this is called acid chyme, when it's ready to be sent into the, the uh, small intestine. So the pyloric sphincter will open up just a little bit to let some, not all, some contents go in there. And uh, that acidity then uh, is sensed by sensory cells and epithelium and uh, releases hormones that lead the pancreas to secrete. Okay, it's a feedback system. So the pH is here. Now what happens to our pepsin? The pH uh, optimum of pepsin is here. This is what we are now in the duodenum. Is pepsin going to continue working? No, it's, it's denatured by that time. And it will be digested. The amino acids are reabsorbed, okay? Redigested, okay? So uh, when this acid gets into the duodenum, as I said, there's certain cells that can sense it. They can sense the pH change and they release a hormone into the blood called excretin. This very rapidly will make it into the pancreas that binds to receptors. Okay, it's a hormone. Hormones will only bind to receptors. This is a shape, counter shape. Inter, uh, interaction. Okay, they have to have uh, surfaces that will fit together, leading to a conformational change of the receptor, and that leads the cell to release um, then the uh, bicarbonate. We'll talk about more than that more when we get into hormones. Okay, this is just a figure showing the position of the pancreas and the gallbladder. They both, this is the duct that opens into the duodenum, but also the bile duct will join with it just before, this is the pancreatic duct, this is the bile duct, and just before um, it reaches the duodenum, they join together. Okay, I'm gonna stop here, all right? Because this here is gonna take too much time. So, you've made it.